All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tolu Lokbaya Dekola. Um, I'm a research fellow with um, the School of Law, University of Queensland. And today I will be taking the fifth uh, masterclass in the online series on intellectual property law. And uh, my presentation today is going to build on uh, the previous lectures delivered by my colleagues. And um, most importantly, uh, uh, the lecture delivered by Shruti uh, on contract law. And um, today I will be speaking on adoption, exploitation and commercialization of intellectual property and how these aspects you know, are crucial for innovators and researchers in maximizing the value of their inventions and innovative ideas. Um, so I hope to speak for uh, like 30 minutes or 35 minutes, and then we can have Q&A afterwards. All right, so uh, my presentation is structured around three key areas. Uh, the first is adoption of intellectual property. And here I'm going to discuss, you know, initial steps involved in identifying and protecting valuable from IP um, assets. Um, I will focus on patent and trade secrets or confidential information, uh, which I think are the two most important, uh, you know, legal regimes uh, given uh, the audience. Um, afterwards, I will delve into, you know, uh, exploitation of intellectual property. And here I'm going to focus on how to leverage IP assets through licensing, technology transfer, and tech um, and strategic partnership. Um, so here I would explore the dynamics of licensing agreements and technology transfer processes. And I will also touch upon IP infringements, uh, remedies for IP infringements, and more importantly, IP defenses. And then lastly, I will discuss um, strategies for bringing IP to market, uh, you know, creating sustainable business models and you know, navigating the commercialization process effectively. Um, here I will touch briefly, depending on time, on um, examples such as direct sales, royalties, subscri subscription models, and uh, mon uh, monetization through digital platforms. Um, I will also discuss open source models like using the Tesla uh, model, um, time permitting. All right, so um, let's get into it. So for researchers and innovators, uh, the perennial question, um, as always, revolved around selecting the appropriate intellectual property for their innovations, creations, and inventions. So um, I will be looking at the peculiarities of patents first. Um, you know, I will touch on the advantages, disadvantages, and you know, um, you know what patents are suitable for. Um, so as we know, um, patents grant exclusive rights to um, inventors for their inventions. Uh, whether they are new products, processes, or improvements on existing products or processes. Uh, Brad already discussed these extensively. And, you know, the exclusive rights, uh, rights that patents uh, provide, uh, you know, gives innovators um, competitive advantage in the market. Now, let's run through the advantages. I'll just pick two important advantages. The first is exclusive rights, you know, one of the primary um, advantages of patents is that they provide innovators with um, exclusive rights for their invention for a limited period, typically 20 years from uh, the filing date. And this exclusivity allows inventors to you know, prevent others from making, using, selling, or importing their invention without permission. And that's a very good advantage. Um, the second is legal protection. You know, Patents offer legal protection against unauthorized um, use or copying of the patented invention. Uh, uh, so this means that inventors can take legal uh, action against infringers who violate their patent rights. Um, that said, there are also some disadvantages, and the first one, which is very important, is um, it's it's more of a, it's 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 a key drawback actually for patents, and that is the requirement for disclosure. So in order to obtain a patent, um, inventors must disclose detailed information about their invention in, in the patent application, including how it works and how it's, and then, you know, it's technical specifications. Uh, so this information becomes public once the patent is granted, which may enable competitors to study and potentially work around the patented invention. 
Now, another disadvantage is, um, you know, um, uh, the fact that um, the process of obtaining a patent can be costly and time consuming. So it involves hiring a patent attorney or agents, you know, conducting prior hard searches, preparing and filing the patent application itself, responding to examination reports, and paying various fees. So you really have to be sure it's worth it. Uh, so in terms of suitability, patents are most suitable for inventions that, of course, meet the criteria of being novel, um, non-obvious, and you know having commercial potential. Um, also, patents is suitable for technologies with high research and development costs, but low imitation costs. And I'm going to give a very good example, like the pharmaceutical industry, for instance. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, the chemical industry, even the biotech industries are characterized by high um, um, research and development costs, uh, but they have they have relatively low imitation costs. Uh, so patents play a significant role in these industries in avoiding imitation and allowing companies to um, recoup their investments. Oh, this is argued. This is this can be argued anyway. Uh, <clears throat> but in contrast, some other industries like the aeronautical industry, you know, th these industries uh, do not have high imitation cost and you know um, um also industry like industries like the software and ICT industries where protection is easy to circumvent. So the importance of patent protection is more questionable in this in this in these industries. Um, so <clears throat> I will go to I will now move forward to trade secrets now and then I will tie the two together. Uh, so for 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 moving to trade secrets um you know the the I I was able to highlight um three key advantages. Uh, the first is no disclosure requirement. So unlike patents, trade secrets do not require disclosure of detailed information about a secret. Uh, so this means that protection is granted without public disclosure. You know this will allow you know your business um, to maintain confidentiality and um, competitive advantage. Um, another advantage is, um, you know, trade secrets can protect a wide range of valuable information, such as formulas, um, processes, customer lists, algorithms, and, you know, proprietary technology. And this flexibility in protection makes trade secret a versatile tool for safeguarding various types of confidential information. Um, now, another advantage is um, the fact that trade secrets can provide long-lasting protection as long as the information remains a secret and efforts are made to maintain um, the confidentiality uh, of, of, of the secret or the confidential information, as it were. Uh, so, of course, this can offer businesses uh, or even innovators a strategic advantage over competitors for an extended uh, period. So uh, moving to the disadvantages now, the first is that unlike patents, you know, where infringement is clearly defined by, by the law, trade secret protection relies on confidential agreements and contractual obligations. Uh, so if a trade secret, uh, for instance, is discovered or disclosed without authorization, legal recourse may be limited compared to, you know, patent infringement cases. Another disadvantage is, you know, um, in protecting trade secrets requires strict confidentiality measures uh, within the organization, including, um, you know, access controls, non-disclosure agreements, employee training, um, you know, <clears throat> digital security measures and all. Uh, so failure to maintain these uh, measures can jeopardize the secrecy of the confidential information. Um, um, so trade secrets, in terms of suitability, um, um, they provide a competitive advantage in the market, correct? And um, uh, so it's 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 also good, just as I've explained, you know, the, the advantages and the disadvantages. And that takes me to the factors that needs to be considered when you want to make a choice as to what legal regime, under which legal regime um, you want to, um, have your intellectual property protected. So now uh, factors to consider, the first factor is, and the most important 
factor is actually, you know, you have to consider the nature of the innovation itself. Is it easily re reverse engineered or replicated by competitors? So understanding the vulnerability of the invention to reverse engineering can help determine the level of protection needed. So if your innovation can be easily reverse engineered, then of course I'm going to suggest patents. Um, what if it can be easily reverse engineered, then it's better to just go for confidential uh, information protection, which is also trade secrets. Um, so we also have to consider the duration of protection needed. Uh, you have to consider, for instance, patents offer protection for a limited period of 20 years, uh, while trade secrets can provide long lasting protection as long as the information you know, remains a secret. Uh, so you have to consider the duration of protection needed for your innovation also. Um, then most important, you have to consider the costs and complexity of obtaining protection. Um, so, uh, patents, for example, can be costly, like I've said earlier, and um, it involves a complex application process, whereas trade secrets may require less, you know, upfront um, investment. Uh, but of course, it demands <laughs> strict confidentiality measures. Um, so you also have to assess the competitive landscape and industry norms regarding IP protection. Uh, so the question to be answered. Uh, the questions to be considered are like, are patents commonly used in, in, in this industry or do trade secrets offer a competitive advantage? So understanding the industry practice can also inform um, your intellectual property protection strategy. So I'm going to quickly use the Coca-Cola uh, uh, Coca beverage beverage formula as a case study. So Coca-Cola's formula is, is a well-known uh, trade secret that has been closely guarded for decades. Uh, the nature of their innovation, uh, which is a unique uh, beverage formula, made it suitable for trade secret protection rather than patenting. Um, of course, this decision aligns with their business goals of maintaining ex exclusivity and you know, preventing competitors from replicating their product. Um, uh, so that's that's a very good example. Um, so now moving to licensing. Uh, so licensing in the context of intellectual property refers to you know, the legal permission granted by an IP owner called the licensor to another party called the licensee uh, to use, sell, distribute, or otherwise exploit the IP rights owned by the licensor, that's the IP owner. Uh, so this permission is typically uh, granted through a licensing agreement, which outlines the terms, conditions, and limitations of the license. So um, I've, I've highlighted uh, four types of licensing uh, uh, agreements, and the first is exclusive license. Uh, so Exclusive licenses, uh, um, you know, it's it's like no other party can use the licensed IP during the license term. So it grants exclusive rights uh, to the licensee. So no other party um, can use the licensed IP uh, during the term of the license. Um, then, but for non-exclusive licenses, you know. This regime allows multiple licenses to use the IP simultaneously, uh, with the licensor retaining the right to license the IP to other parties. Um, so sub-license, uh, on the other hand, allows the licensee to grant sub-licenses to third, third parties, of course, subject to terms of the original license agreement. And then we also have Cross uh, license, which involves you know the exchange of IP rights between two parties. Typically, it's used in situations where both parties have valuable IP to share, like um, the mRNA technology landscape, which which I will touch upon later on. Um, so, like it's the cross cross license. It's it's more of a mutually beneficial strategy, commonly used in in. In, in the biotech industry, where you know multiple companies have overlapping and complementary um, IP portfolios. So now, what are the components of a licensing agreement? The first is uh, for description of the IP. So, um, you know, this description 
you know, is contained in the licensing agreement and, you know, it's this this segment of the agreement clearly defines the intellectual property that is being licensed, including like any patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. Um, and then the, the next um, component of the licensing agreement is you know, the, the license scope, which is very important. So uh, here the, there are specifications on the rights granted uh, to the licensee, such as you know, the geographical scope, the duration of the license, permitted use of the IP, and any exclusivity of arrangement. And more importantly, you also have the royalty and fee clause, uh, which of course outlines the financial terms of the license, including upfront fees, milestone payments, payment um, schedules, and all. And then you have terms and terminations like. This is going to define the duration of the license, renewal options, conditions for termination, and you know, post-termination obligations. And uh, more importantly, confidentiality and non-disclosure. Like uh, this includes provisions for protecting confidential information shared during the licensing process. And you know, the essence of this is just to prevent uh, um, unauthorized uh, disclosure. And then, of course, dispute resolution. So. Uh, this aspect of licensing agreement specifies mechanisms for resolving disputes between the licensor and the licensee, you know, such as arbitration or, med or mediation or even litigation, as it were. Um, so this is um, this clearly explains the idea of licensing um, and. Um, so I've been working on mRNA technology uh, for some time. So, um, you know, so this diagram revolves around patent licensing analysis of mRNA vaccine candidates for COVID-19. So with regard to mRNA vaccines, you know, you could have patent claims covering the mRNA vaccine sequence itself, the delivery system, the dosage regimen, the medical use, processes for producing mRNA vaccine, processes for, for the manufacture of mRNA vaccine and all. Uh, so uh, the, the fact is that a company relying solely on its own patent portfolio is unlikely to successfully develop an mRNA-based based vaccine. So therefore, acquiring the, acquiring the necessary uh, license is essential to avoid uh, infringement of patent rights. So a, a very good example is um, the licensing agreement between BioNTech and uh, Pfizer for the uh, manufacturing of the Pfizer vaccine and um, the relationship also between the National Institute of Health and Moderna. Um, then even bio, BioNTech itself had to secure a license for um, lipid nanoparticle that that's the delivery system from another startup company called Aquitas uh, Therapeutics. So uh, this relationships, you know, illustrates the intricate web of licensing relationships and partnerships required um, um, to, you know, amalgamate various patented technologies to produce a successful vaccine. And um, so this diagram basically, um, you know, brings, drives on the, the fact that licensing is at the core of intellectual property, whether it's um, commercialization or exploitation. All right, so let's now go to uh, begin to explore the different types of intellectual property infringements. I, I will just focus on patents and trade secrets and then um, talk uh, about um, trademark infringement very briefly. So for patents, uh, patent infringements occur when <clears throat> someone engages in, of course, unauthorized use, manufacture, sale, or import and importation of a patented invention. and in the first lecture, Brad rightly said that the protection, like patent protection is territorial. Uh, there is no global protection. So if you have a patent in Australia, then you are protected in Australia. If you need protection in the US, you have to apply uh, for the US patent. Uh, so infringement when it comes to patents, you know, it's, it could include making, using, selling, or offering to sell. Um, uh, to, to, to sell the uh, patented invention without the patent owner's permission, um, of course, in the jurisdiction of protection. 
uh, for trade secret, which I want to touch upon a bit. Um, infringement could take the form of improper acquisition. Um, um, this could include uh, methods, methods like theft, unauthorized access or espionage. Um, this can occur when someone, for instance, gains access to confidential information through unlawful means, um, such as hacking into you know, a company's system or your system or, or stealing a physical um, document. Um, trade secret infringement could also take the form of you know, a breach of confidentiality. Um, of course, this occurs when individuals or entities who are bound by uh, a duty of confidentiality um, divulge, you know, or misuse confidential information. It could be uh, maybe an employee, a contractor, a business partner. And um, so in, in this instance, if confidential information is divulged um, um, uh, for personal gains, uh, or divulged to competitors, or even divulged at all, even if the intention is, is innocent, like this could amount to um, a breach of confidentiality. Uh, for trademarks, um, of course, it's, it occurs when someone uses you know, trademarks in a manner likely to cause confusion, deception, or dilution of the trademark owner's uh, rights. Um, I There's no time to go into the into crisis um, I mean into the um, into into much details about this but just to summarize like this involves like using identical or similar trademarks on goods and services that are related or similar to those covered by um, a registered mark so this could uh, constitute trademark infringement. Um, so now what remedies are available? Um, so if your intellectual property has been infringed, um, um, so the first um, um, remedy is an injunctive relief. Uh, so an, injun an injunctive relief um, is a court order issued to, um, to compel the infringer from um, the, from, uh, to compel the infringer to stop uh, the infringing activity and this remedy is crucial in you know to, in, in all team ongoing infringement and even pro preventing further harm um, to the um, IP owner's right and injunctions can be temporary you know like preliminary injunction maybe um, during litigation um, or it could be permanent when uh, and this, of course, comes after trial and um, uh, all. So remedies could also come in form of monetary damages, which would provide compensation for financial losses suffered during the um, IP infringement. And uh, these damages aim to, of course, reimburse um, the IP owner for actual economic harm caused by the infringing activity, such as lost profits, you know, reduced market share, or cost incurred <clears throat> to address the infringement. Uh, so there's a there's a legal maxim that says uh, where there's a right, there's a remedy. Uh, ubi jus ubi remedon, that's the legal, that's the Latin word for that. So it's like the court will always want to restore you to the position you would have been if the infringement had not occurred. Um, um, so another remedy is, you know, action, uh, sorry, account uh, of profit. Um, so an account of profits remedy allows the IP owner to recover profits earned by the infringer through unauthorized use of the IP. And this remedy, of course, ensures that the infringer does not unjustly benefit from you know, uh, the infringing activity at the expense of the IP owner. So quickly, I will um, just talk briefly about IP defense strategies. Um, so the first defense uh, is invalidity defense. So an invalidity, an invalidity defense uh, involves, you know, challenging the validity of the asserted IP rights in the first place, such as, um, for example, invalidity, uh, the invalidity of of a patent. So if someone is challenging engine the validity of your patent, you could also raise a defense 
that the person's patents shouldn't have been granted in the first place. So, so this defense, defense argues that you know, the high pay rights claimed by the opposing party are not valid due to reasons like maybe prior heart, lack of nobility, of obviousness, or failure to meet legal requirements for patentability. This, of course, is um, more about patents. So another defense could be maybe non-infringement defense. So here you have to demonstrate that the accused activity does not infringe the asserted IP rights. And this defense pre pre presents the, um, you know, evidence and arguments to show that the accused product process or conduct does not fall within the scope of the asserted IP rights. Uh, those, of course, negating any claims of infringement in the first place. Uh, so you, in the realm of copyrights, you also have fair use defense, uh, which uh, you, know, you have to justify uh, the use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as uh, criticism, commentary, news, reporting, or education, I think it would be. Uh, so I'll just say that like implementing IP defense strategies requires legal expertise, um, strategic planning, and a thorough understanding of IP law and regulations. So consultation with an IP attorney, and then of course conducting your own IP audits will, will, will be, will be uh, a robust defense um, strategy in the first place. So, um, so I will now discuss lastly, uh, I'll touch on commercialization of IP and I'll focus on monetization strategies. So monetization strategies involves um, you know, converting IP assets into revenue streams. And uh, two, there are two common approaches. Uh, the first is direct sales versus licensing revenue. So direct sales involve selling products or services based on IP directly to cost to, to to customers. While on the other hand, licensing revenues you know, generated by licensing IP rights to third parties in exchange for royalties and um, and 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 fees. So um so direct sales examples like um okay um Apple's um, direct sales of iPhones and MacBooks you know involve selling their patented technology directly to customers through retail stores and online platforms. Uh, so customers pay the full uh, retail price to own the products outrightly. Um, so an example of licensing revenue, which is another strategy is like, okay, um, a, a, a Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm, for instance, generates um, significant licensing revenue by licensing its um, patented technology, uh, such as wireless communication technologies to smart smartphone manufacturers like uh, Samsung and Xiaomi. Uh, so, so these manufacturers pay royalties to Qualcomm for using their IP uh, in uh, their products. So that's another strategy. Uh, so coming now to IP valuation and uh, pricing models. So IP valuation, of course, assesses the economic value of IP assets, you know, considering factors like market demand, uniqueness, competitive advantage, and potential revenue streams. Uh, on the other hand, pricing models, you know, uh, determine the pricing strategy for IP based products or licenses, you know, such as cost plus pricing, value based pricing, or market based pricing, as the case may be. Uh, so these are um, 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 monetization strategies, and um, you can just, it depends on the, 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 the innovative idea you have, or the nature of your invention, or the industry where you operate also, that will definitely determine what monetization strategy you need to adopt. So more importantly, we also have this idea of open innovation. So you, maybe you don't even need to protect your um, creative ideas or your IP. You, maybe you don't even need to uh, to, to 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 seek protection. Uh, so like open innovation involves you know leveraging external ideas, technologies, and collaborations to to drive innovation and create value. So an example is um, Tesla's open source model, where Tesla um, says, okay, we are not going to protect uh, our, our, our innovation and we're 
going to share our electric uh, vehicle technology with the public to encourage innovation and, and adoption of sustainable transportation solutions. So I think open innovation fits the business model of, of Tesla because they need data uh, for uh, their transportation uh, for, for the transportation solution they um, they aim to bring to the fore. So benefits of open innovation includes like it fosters collaboration and accelerates technology development. <laughs> And um, it also expands market reach and promotes industry standards. Uh, more importantly, it enables organizations to tap into a broader ecosystem of innovators, partners, and stakeholders to drive uh, you know, growth and impact and innovation. And um, another example is um, Moderna and Pfizer. So their mRNA platform, it's actually open. You can access it. And the idea is just for them to, ex to to get more data and to you know um, use the platform to you know encourage innovators to and, and you know to build more partnership. They, they feel it's better to to keep their innovation open than um, to uh, apply for exclusive protection that will um, bar people from having access to the technology. Well, but of course, more importantly, that fits into their business model. So uh, there's no one size that fits all. Uh, so everything will always depend on the peculiarities of the technology and uh, the forecast as to market value and what you really want to do with um, the IP that you have. Um, so um, thank you very much for listening. And of course, in the wrapping up, um, I've explored you know, the dynamic landscape of IP building on the previous lectures delivered. And I hope that um, you all will continue to engage with IP uh, going forward. Um, so um, if you have any questions, uh, feel, please feel free to ask and I'll be very much happy to, uh, to answer them. Um, so there's a question that says, how do I see these different forms? being more or less prevalent over time? Uh, well, I, well, from my conclusion, like I said, everything has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So um, um, technology changes with time and then, the, you know, the market is also very dynamic. Uh, so it's just to know what intellectual property management strategy um to adopt uh part time you know having regard to the dynamics of the market and if you have a business having regard to your goals and aims and uh, so ip serves even not just the markets uh, people people use ip for several reasons and uh, for every reason there will always be a different strategy as to adoption as to access guarantees and you know lots of ages so um there is no yes or no answer to what as to time as to the dynamics of the market when it, it, it depends yeah yeah i wonder if um open innovation may dip. someone is asking whether whether open innovation may increase or decrease in the future well, the future is always hard to predict, but for now, I think most companies um, are beginning to see um, the need to be more open, not because they really want to drive access, but maybe they need more data. Like Tesla, for instance, cannot even afford to um, have patents. Like Tesla needs to be open, at least so that they can get enough data for the, the transportation solution they want to provide, you know. Uh, so for that business model, I think open innovation is going to be very, very helpful. For mRNA platform technologies also, well, to some, it's it's very hard to predict what the future holds, but mRNA technology, for instance, has been said um, to, like it's going to be very much relevant beyond the field of vaccinology. So um, scientists are working on uh, uh, cancer vaccines, for instance, um, make better tropical diseases using mRNA technology. Um, so I think open innovation may also be um, 
um, a good model depending on the size of the company um, and the kind of collaborations needed to actually get the expected results. So uh, as to my guess for the future, yeah, the future is hard to predict. It will definitely depend on the facts on ground at the time. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming, for listening.